Hi, um, Callie Holmes. I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be here in a room of heroes, really. Um, I feel like it's kind of funny following the archivist uh, developer panel because I, this is kind of like like the absolute beginner <laughs> version of archivist developer. Um, I'm going to talk to you all about like our shift towards more open source solutions at the University of Georgia. Um, what I'm going to talk about, give you a little bit of an introduction to my archive, talk about sort of the different, the history of how we've evolved, um, and some strategies I've used for implementing change, and then a bit at the end about what I would like to do. Got um, so just a little bit about um, our collection. So I'm at the Brown Media Archives, which is part of the Special Collections Library, which is part of UGA Libraries, um, which is part of the University of Georgia. It's a large public institution um, in the southeastern United States. Um, it's about 40,000 students, so it's pretty big. Um, we, it's a pretty new archive. We just started, we were just founded in 1995, actually, um, which I was sort of surprised to learn that. Um, we, our collections are sort of in three main categories. We have a lot of news film. Um, so we currently have six news film from six stations across Georgia. Um, we have the Peabody Awards collection, and I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but it's an award giving um, for you know excellence in electronic media. So that it started out being radio, and then radio and television, and now it's pretty much anything that's not like a movie for theatrical release. Um, just to like tie it into some earlier presentations, one of the 2017 winners was uh, the BBC production about um, the plight of the Rohingya refugees. So it can be like Game of Thrones or like a documentary or like an independent production. So it's a really cool collection and we have all the entries going back to 1940. So a lot of those earlier broadcasting entries like the stations weren't necessarily keeping a copy of that, but we have an example of, you know, like what this station in Milwaukee thought was like their best news story of the year. So it's a really cool collection. And then everything else is like the other stuff, and I like hate calling it the other stuff, but it's just like anything that's not news film or Peabody. So whole movies, um, interview collections, being a part of university, we have um, we have a lot of like football, like American football <laughs> films, um, folklore collections, a lot of stuff like that. Um, yeah, we have we have a, a good amount of stuff, about 250,000 physical items and over a petabyte of digital content. Um, this is my building. We moved into a new building in 2012. Previously, the three departments that are part of the Special Collections Library were sort of scattered in different basements. Um, so this was like a big fundraising effort. Um, and what you can't see is below the building is a underground 30,000 square foot high density storage vault, um, which is really nice, ideal for storing lots of different physical formats. Um, we have a great uh, gallery space where we can put our things up on exhibit, including audiovisual items. We have um, a, um, space for classes. We bring in a lot of um, undergraduate and graduate classes. Uh, we have great event space, but um, I don't have to ask you what's missing from this list. <laughs> there's really like no, there was no digital infrastructure planned um, when this building was made. Um, none of the none of the millions of dollars were for like a really fancy system. Um, and I don't really just mean this as like just like a dig at my employer because I think this actually happens like surprisingly often with big initiatives. Um, and I th I think it's um, it kind of boils down to like this picture. Uh, so on the left, um, yeah, on the left is my colleague Margie um, and her film lab. She collects unique film reels she comes across and adds them to her reel wall. And on the right are these lovely LTO tapes. There's a variety of colors. Some of them are LTO three. Some of them are LTO five. We have LTO sevens, and so we have like people coming through, tours, interns, donors. Like everyone takes a selfie in front of Margie's real wall, and like literally no one has ever even like glanced at the LTO tapes, um, and like myself included. I mean, it's horrible, and um, I think there's just like something that's like easy to like push digital to the side because analog audiovisual formats, I mean even videotapes are kind of appealing, at least more appealing than like a bunch of LTO tapes. Okay, so that's sort of an overview and now I'm gonna kind of shift into talking about how our 
digitization and like digital preservation has um, evolved. And um, when I was like setting out to do a presentation on our shift towards more open media, I just felt like we really had to talk about like where we're coming from. And when I started like gathering information for that, I felt like it was almost turning into an oral history project. Um, it, and it really kind of crystallized for me how important people are to digital archives and how much like someone's attitude and someone's background and someone's like willingness or unwillingness to do things differently can really like shape an archive. And um, I just think it's a really important part of our history. Um, so, these are the three eras of digitization, um, and I will, <laughs> I was a little like hopped up on like spending the last week in Scotland where it's like the Bronze Age and everything. So I felt like, I like hesitated about using people's names, but then I'm not using last names and it'd probably be hard to figure it out because I didn't, anyway. Um, so we'll start with the James era, which is really when digitization begins, move into the Alex era, which is when we start shifting towards more open source and then me, I've been, in my, I've been in my position about two years now, almost exactly two years, so um, the present. Uh, there is the prehistoric era, but nothing really happened from 1995 to 2007 digitally, like uh, here and there, but nothing, nothing major. However, um, starting in the mid to late 2000s, um, we got a couple of grants that really kick-started our digitization process. The first was um, part of the formation of the Civil Rights Digital Library, um, which was mostly, um, most of the materials for this were film, and a lot of that was like outsourced digitization. Um, uh, a lot of this from our news film collections. We have a lot of civil rights heroes in those collections, and also like the evildoers as well. Um, we then, shortly after that, we got another grant to digitize um, local public television programs that were part of the Peabody collection. And all, pretty much all of that was on three quarter inch pneumatic. And that was, more of that was done in house and we purchased a couple of SAMA machines that were producing lovely MXF wrapped JPEG 2000 files, which you will hear from again. Um, so in this James era, um, and really until very recently, James was the only person doing digitization or digital preservation at all. And um, it was really great that he was able to sort of keep digitization going after these grants ran out. He was originally hired as a, as a grant employee and then was kept on full time. Um, and James's background was really in video production. So he um, was more really aware of like industry trends. Um, he like had always hated the JPEG 2000 files. So as soon as he could, he shifted away from those. Um, we have a lot of MOV wrapped files of um, unknown innards. Um, he, James also like uh, shifted us to using Mac computers, which is just really uncommon in uh, like American universities. Leave like to this day, we're the only department that's really like all Mac computers. Um, so we're using Final Cut Pro. Um, and once James moved on to a different position, um, Alex started. And um, so this is like 2012 to 2016, roughly. And um, during this time period, we start to see both like more open source solutions and also like a really increasing demand for our collections. And when I say demand, it's a lot of it is a very particular demand. Um, we, we do get, we do have a lot of student researchers and academic researchers, but I think because of the nature of our collections, we get a lot of um, like production companies working on documentaries or podcasts or whatever. Um, and it's, it's a really particular kind of researcher. Like, always in a hurry, um, they don't necessarily, not, most of them don't really care what the file looks like. Um, maybe they do a little bit, but um, we, there's still only like one full-time staff person involved with anything digitization, digital preservation related. Um, and Alex started um, as an audiovisual technician and then in 2015 he was hired as our first digital archivist which, you know, I think Ashley mentioned earlier, it's just like a ridiculous job title. Uh, I had the opportunity to change it recently, but I like, couldn't think of anything better. Um, so just like a brief aside, 
I'm not really sure what it's like internationally, but in the U.S., there's a divide in academic libraries between sort of professional and paraprofessional positions. And um, like generally speaking, the to get a, one of the professional positions, you have to have a graduate degree, usually in library science, but sometimes in like a related field. And you're expected to you know, be contributing to the academic community and going to conferences and um, you're paid more. Um, and I'm always like kind of tempted to roll my eyes at this a little bit because like I've been on the other side of the divide and sometimes I think it's just like a way to like cause unnecessary divisions between your staff and also maybe like devalue work that people are doing. But anyway, the, the reason I mentioned this here is because I think it's significant that there was finally like money and support to hire a digital archivist. And I think it sort of shows that like the larger UGA libraries um, administration is sort of starting to notice like the small mountain of digital files we're creating and realizing that this needs to be dealt with in a more like holistic way. Um, and Alex did have that um, library school background, but he was also really good at, I mean, he's a perfect archivist developer. Um, so he introduced a lot of scripting, um, started using FFmpeg and media info, um, and a lot of bash and Python scripts. Um, also during this time period, we purchased a film scanner. So um, we were able to do um, 2K film scans, which means we have so many DPX files. Um, our storage needs are like growing like crazy. Um, Alex also introduced collective access to try and manage our growing um, analog and digital collections, which Collective Access is an open source sort of collection management system and it can really be customized a lot and manage a bunch of different kinds of collections, which um, basically Alex was able to get Collective Access about like 75% of the way set up before he, um, before he left. Um, and it's sort of been a struggle to get that last 25% done. I feel like it's a little bit like the analogy yesterday about um, being given a farm, because it's like, like I can see like the cows in the pasture over there, but like I don't know where the gate is to like put more cows in or like move those back into the barn. Um, so I feel like that kind of created a little bit of like open source baggage because if there are times where I would mention open source things and they're like, oh, you wanna do open source, like collective access open source. And I mean, collective access is like theoretically lovely and one day I think it will be lovely for us, but it's just been a hard. Um, so that's when I come into the picture, and um, basically it all feels a little bit overwhelming. Um, we have increasing demand, which translates to increasing output. Um, I think between 2012 and 2017, there's something like 400% more requests for our materials. Um, we have this LTO back backlog. We still have a few LTO threes running around. We have almost 1,000 LTO-5 tapes, some of which are not LTFS, they are tar, and they are horrible. Um, we have some spotty documentation, <laughs> which is like maybe a complement to our documentation that we have. Um, and then a lot of our collection information is stored in, you know, quirky idiom idiomatic spreadsheets, and um, just knowing, like, there's just not good documentation for, like, what, how these files were encoded or what programs were being used. And I don't wanna sound like I'm like, I really am like very grateful for everyone. Like everyone kind of pushed this forward in a different way. Um, so like there are things that I am not doing well. So it's not that I think that my predecessors didn't do well, it's just that no one has time to get everything done. Um, we have some folders with some files in them. <laughs> um, it's like, always surprising to me how hard it is to figure out like, is this digitized yet? Um, and just like, just kind of basic questions are sort of hard to figure out when everything is in a bunch of different places. Um, access is a true nightmare. Um, we have at least five different systems and um, I spend a lot of time just trying to figure out like, what's the best way to get this person this file? Or, you know, is this, we have a couple of um, 
databases that have like home, very homegrown databases that have been around for 20 years, um, which are like super sturdy and never crash, except like they don't always play the attached media very well. Um, they really like flash files. Um, so that just like takes up a lot of time. Um, and then they're sort of like, the other duties is assigned, except these actually are like written out duties in my job description. But there's a lot going on that I'm supposed to be doing. So like just um, supporting like the teaching mission, so helping with classes, um, just being part of university committees. Uh, you know, like for anybody out there playing like digital preservation bingo, like doing track assessments. Um, so it's, it's just like a lot. And I feel like there's sort of like two conflicting realities here. Um, there's like on the one hand, I know we need like a more manageable system with like better tools and better workflows. But on the other hand, it's so hard to find the time to not only do like the high level planning, but to actually implement those changes and make sure they work. Um, so what follows are like some strategies that I have found for like trying to go about, like when you're feeling overwhelmed, figuring out a way to implement some changes. Um, so first is to find a community. Um, so when I came to UGA, my, my previous job was at the Library of Congress Packard Campus for Audiovisual Conservation, where I was like surrounded by all kinds of AV experts. And so I went from that to being like the AV expert, which was sort of uh, jarring, um, and it felt like I really didn't have anyone I could turn to, like, in the cubicle next door to ask advice. Um, and so I mentioned, you know, we didn't have a digital preservation system, and actually I think in the long run that turned out to be kind of nice because there were a group of us who were hired around the same time, and there was, like, a lot of people were like, this is something we need. So we there was a digital curation working group was formed, and we sort of planned a lot of the policies and helped choose, like, the architecture for our digital preservation system. Um, and um, sort of out of that work, we kind of could see what – what previously seemed like totally different things we were doing with, we realized we like, like we all have spreadsheets. I mean, isn't everything like a spreadsheet like in the end? Um, and so we were able to like form connections and we kind of grew into this like lib tech learn group, lib learn tech. Um, so we formed like a listserv and then we meet once a month and we kind of, um, you know, it's, it's a community of practice where we're sort of like teaching each other how to do things or just trying to figure it out and just having like people you can email and be like, do y'all know how to make your OCR do this or something? So um, it's been really great, and we've been able to get like some of our more like true developer people in the UGA libraries ecosphere involved. Um, we have this really great developer who he like learned Python, so he could help us with Python, um, and it's also helped us unify workflows across departments. Um, sort of related to number one is number two, internal outsourcing, um, which is sort of what I consider, like, when I ask people who, like, I am not in charge of <laughs> to help me with things. Um, and I think it's difficult for two reasons. Like, it's only, like, a little bit difficult for me to ask for help. But the bigger problem is sometimes I see these beautiful little problems that would be so satisfying to sit down and take the time to solve on my own, like I have to like really figure out the perfect Python script, and like I just don't have time to do it. Um, so, asking like giving away those future satisfaction moments is sort of hard. Um, but uh, you know, just some examples I've gotten. Some people uh, we have a head of digital curation now um, who has a little bit more time to do more research and working on these problems, and things just like fixing XSL style sheets or turning my um, sort of messy like bash scripts for creating our apes, turning those into Python, um, you know, batch renaming like really crazy PDF schemes. Um, I was even able to get someone who's like technically not even like a UGA libraries employee, but who had server space and an interest in like video production to help me um, transcode a bunch, like 15,000 files with FFmpeg. So um, it's really been, really useful for me. Um, number three, challenges or opportunities. And I don't just mean to be like corporate speak. Um, so all these problems, just like acknowledging that they're problems. We, that, I mean, I don't, we talked about DPX files earlier today. So everything Jerome said, um, plus we had like the added 
bonus, like for a while, our open source virus scanning software attached to our digital preservation system was flagging like random DPX out of like 25,000 files. It would flag one as being this obscure virus. And I just knew it wasn't. <laughs> but like trying to tell like the IT people that, uh, like, well, I mean, I wouldn't believe me. Anyway, luckily I like put in a ticket on this on Clam AV and like attached my false positives and they like changed it. And so they weren't being flagged anymore. So that was great. But they, DPX files are still a horrible nightmare. Um, the JPEG 2000 files from our SAMA machines, um, like I'm not really a video person. All I know is when you like double click them, they do not really play um, in any version of VLC player or anything. Um, I luckily like Dave Rice is here and I sent him a sample and he's like, yeah, you do like this weird command and then they'll play. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. I am like, I printed that out and like taped it to a wall. So like <laughs> when I win the lottery, somebody else will know how to play those files. Um, so yes, going from if it ain't broke, don't fix it to like, this is broken. We should, we all see this is broken. And it's kind of like make, like those problems affected people outside of me. So it was easy to be like, yeah, we need a new file format. Um, Seizing the moment, um, uh, I mentioned this to Ben last night at supper. Um, so we got a an HPRC. I don't even know what that acronym means. Um, grant to preserve four thousand hours of public broadcasting content from the Peabody Awards collection, and this grant was like sort of developed before I was really on board, and so I didn't really have any input into like the technical specifications, except that in the, like the rat's nest of bureaucracy, we ended up having to redo that and put the contract out for open bidding, and they were like, "Do you want to change anything about the technical specifications?" And I said, "Well, I was like hopped up on Ben and Genevieve's presentation from No Time to Wait last year." And I was like, yes, yes, I do. Um, and so I like truly just like in five minutes, like went to their GitHub page, copied their technical specifications, pasted them in a Word document. And I was a little bit scared to do that. But also with this particular project, WGBH and also the Library of Congress get copies of the files. So I was like, how bad could it be? Like there are two other copies out there. It'll be fine. Um, and number five, uh, lean on y'all. Um, take my advice and just ruthlessly steal everyone else's workflows. Because I think there are a lot of us who like just have too much on our plates. And the more uh, the more Kirans we have out there who we can like copy from, it really just makes the whole community better. I've gotten a lot of a lot out of like the EMEA open source committee. I don't know what I would do without FF Improviser. It's amazing. And like there's so many people in this room who I like We've never met. I have completely like stalked you online and know like everything about like every. I know your GitHub page is by heart. I do not know how to use GitHub. I wish I did. Um, so moments yet to be seized. Um, just quickly, things I would like to do in the future. Um, right now, we're using FFE1 and Matroska for video digitization, but we've not yet started using Raw Cooked. I want to do that. Um, we have these big news film reels that um, are really complicated because it's a, a very, like, a lot of files, but they're described at, like, the clip level. And so it's been a, a real hassle to figure out, like, both from preservation and access-wise, like, how to divide that file up. And I think the chapter feature could be a good solution for that. Um, I do not use media conch, and I should. Um, and also, I want to figure out how to give some of our money to support these open source projects, which sort of embarrassingly is something I just haven't even thought of doing before. But I've been really inspired by other presentations at this conference to figure out how to do that at my institution. So. We have two minutes for questions. Is there? Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Were you able in the end to play the SAMA files with anything? Um, yes. I actually tried to find this email to figure out exactly what was wrong with them. Um, but yes, after running them, like retranscoding them with FFmpeg into a, a, it's a still a JPEG 2000 MXF file, then they would play it with, FF, with VLC. Oh, cool. I thought yeah. it wouldn't work with FFmpeg. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I ask for these LTO tapes. They are still in this shelf. Um, one copy is. There's another full set, um, and it, it's like, I mean, like if Athens, Georgia gets knocked out by a meteor, like they'll be gone, but they're in another building on campus. You were mentioning collective X's and that you had like 70 something percent set up and there's like yeah. 20 something missing. And then you said collective X's like, hmm. So my question would be, is it because the 20 something percent are still missing or because the collective access engine is? I think what's happened there is that um, my predecessor did like some customization stuff that's hard to figure out exactly what's happening there. And so some of it's like bigger in that it's like, is it keeping the original file or transcoding the original file? And, but some of it is like smaller, just like this field displays like all smushed together. In which of these configuration files do we change that? Um, so that's part of the problem. Um, I think ultimately, we're actually in the process now of like reevaluating like, do we stay the course with collective access or do we look for another solution? I mean, the, the, the really appealing thing about collective access is that it, in theory, could handle physical collections, digital collections, the delivery, like the access side of things. Um, so it can do a lot. I just don't know if we have like the skills and the, a way to make it work for us. And we might, I don't know. Okay, that's um, the time for now. So I'll just introduce the next speakers.